Us. Us. Hey, Rich. How you going? Good to see you. Great again. to see yeah. you too. Uh, someone will turn up. But any, anyway, look, today we're just going to have a quick look at uh, the Uke Waza. Uke Waza means the uh, blocking techniques. Um, there's always controversy about that word, uke, jodan uke, chudan soto uke. Uke has been translated uh, to block. But we know the verb. Hi, Rochelle. Hi, Daniel. Hey, Matush. Marco, good to see you. But the verb in Japanese, ukeru, means to receive. It means a lot of things. Okay, so I don't necessarily agree that it's wrong to call it a block. But knowing that the word ukeru is the verb to receive, or at least that's one uh, use of the word, Us. it encourages you to think a little bit more about the block. Yep. Okay, it's it's never a hard. I mean, some styles do, like you take um, uh, pray manis tong long things like that, where they actually work on the idea that whatever you throw at me, I'm going to destroy. So their concept of a block is really. We want to smash it. That's the that's the um, the Tong Long approach to life, and they're really good at it. Um, but for us, ukewaza, the blocking techniques, it's a convenience. It really is. I think the early interpreters, uh, who uh, Chris Dunn <laughs> and the Croatian killer, what a combo! Os <laughs> Krasiv and everyone else. Os. Os. Hey, Patty, good to see you, man. Christian and Mitch. <laughs> live together, train together, fought against each other in tournaments. So they're just having a little bit of a joke. Uh, but the uke waza, look, I can understand from a from a, an interpreter's viewpoint, you've always got to find an interpretation that is convenient, that works, that gets the spirit and the energy of what you're trying to translate over. Uh, and uke waza, there, I don't think there is a better translation than the blocking techniques. Because the whole, even in boxing, they'll say, you know, you just block it like this. So the word block is universally accepted to mean those defensive receipts or those defensive shapes and movements. Uh, but, yeah, the verb ukeru, um, uke doesn't mean to receive. Uke is a noun. Ukeru is the verb to receive. That does, But it also means, look, if I could look up ukeru right now, and it would show a thousand different um, meanings, meanings to it. Yeah. Good to see you, Patty. Jed, how are you, man? Nice to see you. I've got something for you, too. I'll have to get your postal address because I don't know if I'll be able to get over in time, but I've got a gift for you. And Mike Clark, was good to see you. Oops. And Toddy, thanks. So, anyway, here we are. Uh, we're just going to talk about the, uh, the, the hand positions because. Different styles have different ways of doing things. Kyokushin has their way of doing the blocks in basics. And uh, even within Kyokushin, uh, some people do it differently. 100% fine. Uh, if the way, like Solsai says, if the way you do it works, well, then that's the right way. I love that. That's just so sensible. Um, there's only one, Solsai said, there's only one correct way to do any technique. But if the way you do it knocks them out, that's, that's the right okay. way. <laughs> Hard to argue. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to briefly look at the uh, blocking positions. I'll just get Mitch to stand up for a sec so I can get the camera aligned. Beautiful. There, like that. Okay, so let's just, we're just going to look at, so we'll go Sun Shin Dachi. Come on, Ted. Good. So here is the first thing we're looking at. And... Mitch is going for his which stand, but anyway, um, I've asked Mitch to deliberately do it badly so I can correct him. <laughs> <laughs> I wish, <laughs> but anyway, the first thing is the inside of the elbow is in line with the outside of the body, so there's no space here. The elbow is on the inside of the body. The inside of the hand is in line with the outside of the shoulder. So once again, there's no space. So sometimes you see people that go, yo, come on, tip. And they do this big movement. And they're only doing what they're taught, so the, the instructor is wrong, not the student. And if you're, you're doing it like this, there is no possible 
meaning to that. Anything, I always use the concept, anything outside the line of your own body, the government looks after. That's why you pay taxes, okay? You just look after this part here. That's enough controversial, controversy and trouble as, trouble as it is. Okay, so inside of the elbow, in line with the outside of the lat, inside of the hand, in line with the outside of the shoulder. Just turn around, Mitch. This way. Yes. And, and just move forward so the darkness of your hand is against that pose. So here is the next thing, the height of the hand. I'm just going to keep checking comment. Boss, Michelle, this is for you. <laughs> this is for Michelle. And, uh, and uh, I had a couple of messages about this. And Rochelle, and, but the height of the hand, what is the correct height of the hand? I'm only teaching what Sol Sai taught at Hombu. The correct height of the hand is the shoulder is in line with the wrist, not the fingertips. Now, if you do it at your dojo, they do it at fingertips, and you can justify that through clear reasoning, 100%, go for it. But the way Sol Sai taught was... The wrist is shoulder height. Well, why? Why would that be correct? And so face the front again, Mitch. Here's the answer. It's very simple. Mitch goes from here to a fighting stance. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, no, that's good. Now, if the finger, if the tip of the fist is in line with the shoulder, you immediately feel that the hands are low. And he opens the hands, they're still low. You're not going to block a kick there. You're not going to block anything. The hands are still low. On the other hand, if he picks up the wrist to shoulder height, okay, now he goes into the fighting stance. You can see that the hands have elevation. And if he was to open the hands, face the camera, he would be at under the bridge. Okay? So the fundamental reason, thanks, Mitch, the fundamental reason why... The wrist is shoulder height, not the fingertips, is because from wrist, open the hands, and you have the hands high enough for what we call under the bridge. We, keep, we teach the concept, we call it under the bridge, tell the kids under the bridge, and they lift their, their elbows come in, it's like a bridge. Elbows vertical, directly under the hand, hands above the eyebrows. Okay, I close my fists and go like that, and I have the wrist at shoulder height. But if my hand, my fingertips at shoulder, my wrist, my fist is at shoulder height, when I open the hands, I go to here, it's too low. Unfortunately, a lot of guys fight like this, and they get knocked out, because you, you can't have your hands ever in a position where you need to react. You need to have your hands a little higher. Um, I'm talking about sport fighting with that. Okay, so... Let's go through the blocks one at a time. So let's we'll go Sun Chin, come like that. There we go, Jordan Uke. Okay. Once again, it's a 45 degree thing, but you notice our fist is in line with the outside of the body. So let's break it down. Drop the elbow first. One. There's your block. So I'm in this situation here. Someone throws something at me. That's the block. There, like that. So, if Mitch paints it this way, and I throw a punch at him, and his hand is just like normal fighting stance, and I throw the punch there. See that? That block. Now, in a tournament, you'd normally just block and counter straight away. Oh, that was a good punch, Mitch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to bust this ball. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to have a hard time. Okay. So, normally in a tournament, block, counter straight away. Okay. In a Real situation, you may do the same thing. The counter might be a jab in the eyes or a thumb in the throat. But also, if he throws the punch and I drop, then that's where the upper block takeaway. So we call this the takeaway. Block, takeaway. Block, takeaway. Now notice, when I come up, my hand goes to the, the side of my body and it stays in line. It doesn't go off that line in any way. But if I don't turn my body, it doesn't work. So I've got to wedge my body in. You see, now it's in line with my body. If I was to straighten my body, it would be over here. So this is one of the mistakes as instructors we can pick up in students. 
is quite often their shoulders aren't being used. So they go here, here, like this. And fundamentally, the arm's not so bad. It's just that they haven't turned the body. Okay, so you've got it's really important as instructors, one and push it up. One, push it up like that. Okay, so the correct position, once again, Mitchell has his son chin yet, and he does jaw down with okay. So essentially, what it is, it's just off the forehead, the line, 45 in shoulders, essentially. If it's 47 and a half, no one's going to complain. 45 in the shoulders, the arm going up, 45 here. So I've created this strong frame. A block is a lock, is a blow, is a throw. So that movement, if I was to throw the punch and he was to block down, take my arm away with the block, and he can drive that forearm into me as a forearm jolts across my head, things like that. Okay, so Mitch throws the punch. Boom, there's my block. There's my takeaway. I can drive in with that, have it strong there too. Or I can drop down, and even if some, uh, depending on the situation, one, and I can start to drive my forearm there, I can also drive it across the throat so that that upper block becomes um, a blow as well. The other thing too um, is it's a great way if I get a good grip here, that upper block also works as a nice choke across the neck. So the exact same movement there. One here, one there. Actually, you probably have to bring them on top there. See this movement? The push-pull. Remember, we're always trying to, trying to work on the push-pull principle. Pull, pull, push. Okay, so the upper block has those applications. But as instructors, it's important that we realise that the shoulder has to turn. If I'm in the correct position, and my shoulder isn't turned, my arm goes off the wrong line. So I need to make sure. Okay, chudan soto uke. So, yeah, face the camera. So, chudan soto uke from the outside now. Just have a quick look at the comments. What's George? Thanks for coming. Michelle, Gary. What's good to see you, Rob, from up the road. Yes, Jed, you always. I always uh, love Jed's grasp of basics. Good. So once again, in line with the opposite side of the body. There's no point in stopping it here because if the punch comes in there, I haven't blocked it. So the uchiuke, soto, uh, uchiuke, soto uke, and the geirambara are all connected to the position of the elbow, which we'll get into with more depth in a sec. Yeah, the lights are on. That's good. Okay. So. Mitch withdraws one, and he, see, he comes all the way from behind his body. This is just the basics, the way we do the basics in Kyokushin. And two, he retracts this like he's hitting an elbow behind, and the wrist is shoulder height. Okay? That's really important. Now, in a tournament, this is probably the most commonly found or commonly occurring block. In a tournament, I throw that sort of this. I throw a punch, and it, you just, Mitch is... Just doing that, boom, boom, there yeah, like this. Sometimes I, I used to use more get on but I move it so when the punch comes, I, I can knock it down here too, and the punch, and you can continue with the, the, that little circular motion like that, okay? So that Chudan Soto again is very common in tournaments. Man, you yeah, how the start to do this sort of thing with that much thought, and it just doesn't take much to do it. Okay, so Chudan Soto here, the position of the wrist is shoulder height, not the fingertips. Uchiuke comes from inside. This is one I always found interesting because one day when I had nothing better to do, I counted all the techniques in all the kata that we do. And the most common technique in all the kata is Chudanski. But the second most common is Uchiuke. And that was interesting because you don't see Uchiuke much in tournaments. But you do see Uchiuke a lot in range four, range five, and also in self-defense situations. Simply because now if Mitch throws the punch at me, there's my dealing with that punch. And that, that's where the Uchiuke comes in, this movement here. So it may be I come here, here. Oh, sorry, Mitch. Oh. Sorry about that. Oh, good. No, good. One, two, 
and I'm working on this idea of pulling his hand, pulling the elbows together, punch the other hand. One, two. See here, this movement here, you, you, you get a good jolt, oh, but I've never successfully broken any arms with it. Not that I go out hunting for elbows, but I can tell you now, the body is incredibly resilient, so you get a good jolt there. I do find I get good cutty arm bars when I'm grappling with guys. So I'll come in here like this, and I'll get this sort of movement here to get the cutty arm bar. That works um, a lot, but it's a different thing. So the punch comes. One. Look, Ruchuka there. One, two, three, or even four, or even there. Take down with a two on one. So these all come off the Ruchuka. So remember, Ruchuka is when we do it in basics, we keep this hand on the center line. Elbows touch, then we finish the block. Hand stays on the center line, elbows touch. So when Mitch does the technique here, he walks, so he goes, yep, which you can. So look at the angle of the shoulders. Good angle, 45, wrist, shoulder height. And then when he does the block, there, look, the, do it slow, the elbows touch. And then the hand comes underneath the arm. Uh, instructors have to watch out. Sometimes beginners will go under one side and top the other. They do this sort of thing. But if it goes on top, Mitch throws the punch at me. If I go on top, I block nothing. I come underneath, now I block everything. Okay, so that's really important to understand that, that movement. Uh, again, wrist, shoulder height, that's vital. Okay, get on bare. Once again, get on bare. It's also taught three different get on bare. And if you look at this is karate, he teaches the juju, what they call juji get on bare, starting up here like this. And I think it was an early response to Mawashi um, Uke, Mawashi Gedi. So, of course, now has your Mawashi Gedi on. Yeah, you get it up. So we work on the cox comb, which is exactly the same thing, except we work a baseball grip this way, not this way. So juji get on bare is a baseball grip this way, reversed. Cox comb get on bare is the hand is up and here. So the cox comb works on the idea. I'll get him to do it. I'll get this is a great drill that you could do with students when you don't have students who have good flexibility, but you still need to develop. The ability to defend strong head kicks working on the cox comb. You get them to swing the arm as though it's a kick. There, and I work that. So I'm here in my fighting stance. Swing it. Yep, it doesn't matter. Me swings the arm like it's a kick, and I train this idea of cox comb. But notice this the other arm. In reality, against a kick, the kick may not even touch this. This is what we call the insurance policy, the 80 20. The 80 20 concept. If you're confident 100% of the time, you can just block it like that. But the reality is, people are sneaky, and somewhere, someday, you'll need that insurance policy. So we're here. Boom. Look, there's the gate on the juji get on butter. And back to here. One, two, one, two. This is a really good drill to get your students developing the body position for. Blocking the head kicks. And then when the head kick comes, do it. Yeah, that's it. See, I have my cox comb up, I have my hand here, my body weight is correct, and everything is solid. Okay, it comes in. Good. There's my gate on but I take away. There's my gate on but I take away. Okay, so you see that the juji gate on but I works really well against uh, kicks. The other type of gedambare taught was the mawashi gedambare, which is here, circle around. But the most common one taught at Hombu was the standard gedambare with the elbows coming together like that. So the circular one, it works well in a situation, someone throws a punch at you, boom, maybe that's what you're doing, you can take them down there, like that sort of movement. So the circular motion comes there. There's a book I, I saw it once, I don't know, but I think it's called 108 Applications for Gedambara. Gedambara, that movement of Gedambara is, is really, really useful and it's really worth uh, experimenting with. This height, so that the, 
the gate of the circular mawashi gate of Barai works on the idea of this large circular motion. And down, Ramba, I think you do a lot of things from that circular motion, which is straight out of uh, mawashi you get as well. The main one is the standard gate on Barai. So um, face that way, Mitch. Yeah. So Mitch. That's it, good. So left hand down, I'll do it sideways so you can see. So the elbows come together, hand comes next to the ear, and the elbow drops down there. Notice a strong push-pull there, one, two. So the hand returning to chamber, as was taught by Miyagi Chojun, the re hand returning to chamber has something in it, okay? So you can use that idea this also here we did before is probably a better explanation rather than Jordan again, get on butter here like this. You pull in, back fist, back fist, um, stop there like that, or even a good solid choke and a good forearm jolt. That's all get on butter motion. You see that motion there where you're retracting the hand here like this. Uh, there's various applications. The important thing we're looking at today is not so much the application, but the actual execution of the technique for, for Kihon. So Mitch comes over, one, look, elbows touch. That's really important. And then the hand wipes down the arm, yes. And once again, finishes on the outside of the body. You don't want to block over here. We're not doing that. We pay taxes, so let the government worry about that. One, elbows locked together. See that? That's the key. That's where the block is. Two. So we can be, we can look at, thanks, Miss. So we can look at it perhaps from the, uh, the notion of Mayagiri. So Mayagiri comes, look, there's your get on, but I, but I always have that up because you say to my kids at the dojo, what's the art of fighting? And they all yell out, sneakiness. Okay, because you've got to be sneaky. Deception. The art of war is deception. Okay, so if Mitch wants to get me in the head, God oh, kicks me. No, no, he kicks me. He goes, oh, this guy's a sucker. He drops his hands, and on the third one, he fakes it, and bang, next thing you know, he knocks me out. So that's why I always have the cops come up, but the get on bare still works there against that front kick. So the get on bare is very strong against kicks, especially if you counter straight away. There. Or it's also very strong against punches when they come in. Oh, I want to move in here. If I want to move in, for example, into this sort of choke finish. So the Gedambare has very good practicality as well. But remember, in line with the body. The last block we want to look at, Uchi Uke Gedambare. Well, the name of the technique tells you what it is. Uchi Uke Gedambare. And we combine them. And this to me is probably the number one blocking combination that I used over the years when I do Kumite, because I'd always work on the idea of pulling the elbows together. So if I was sparring, quite often a punch would come, I just block it like that and then open. So if you watch, we'll do this bit face the camera and I'll face here. Look, it's important you see it from the side because it's not a, a Propeller on an airplane moving on a flat plane. It comes in and out, in and out, just like which you care, in, out, get them butter, in, out, in, see, it goes forward, forward, and back. Okay, so when Mitch does it, first thing is the elbows touch together. That's really important. If your elbows touch together there, you'll block anything along the center line from the hand up to the head. Okay, so it's really important. This is probably one of the biggest errors I see when I travel is the arms don't come together. <clears throat> and it feels good, starting point solid, finish point solid, but the execution in the middle is all wrong. It's important that the elbows come together. Because look, let's say Mitch doesn't bring his elbows together. The entire center line is compromised. Whether I was kicking, punching, all the way up there, there is zero block. But if the elbows come together, the entire center line is covered. So now, when we do this just for fun, I say to Mitch, just throw something.
from the head to the groin. And as he does it, I just make sure I bring my elbows together. It doesn't matter, I can't determine See, by the but now watch what happens. I'll turn here so you can see me get smashed. If I don't bring my elbows together, boom, boom. Doesn't matter where he punches, I'm not covered. But I bring the elbows together, and then what I do next is what determines the follow through. See that? Elbows there, like that, arm drag, whichever. So, once again, face the front, Mitch. So, wrist, shoulder height, get on, buddy. Elbows come together, one. And then I used to say it's like ripping epaulets off the shoulders. Hands come in, and then they shoot out again. One, two, three. One, two, three. See the arm. Watch Mitch's elbows come together, one. Watch my hands come in, two. And push out again, three. A, a good drill. Thanks, Mitch. A good drill. I just, you could probably get that posted here is you get the guys against the wall to check that the timing's right, they have both hands on the wall. Come in, out, in, out, in. That's a good way to make sure that you have the uh, movement correct. It's a great chair, So let's have a look at some of the comments here. Oh, it's Rodney. Nice to see you, man. Us, Matus. Yes, look, whatever your sensei teaches, do it, but that's a good call. I left that out. The hand comes up, and it's not so much the wrist. You never twist the wrist isolated from the arm, Matus. You keep the, the wrist solid all the time, and it's the arm which twists. That's a good call. You go from there, and I used to say it's like if you had a stick in your hand, that stick would be poking you right in the forehead. That's the finished position of the fist. Yeah, good good point, Matush. Us Duval, nice to see you, man. Jed, perhaps the receiving interpretation from the energy perspective to receive the energy intent. 100%. That, and that's actually at different levels too, Jed. I mean, you know what it's like. I remember I used to watch the uh, Nakakura sensei, the 10th Dan Kendo master who came and did a couple of sessions uh, with the kendo guys who happen to train at the same place as us and talk about receiving at a high level. I mean, this guy was literally, I think, 77 years old, fighting Australian champions, and they couldn't touch him. Wow. He just, just there. And he would read their intent. He would receive their intent. He would receive their emotional intent before they would even move. So he knew what they were going to do before them. So that's a good one. of the first things I bumped into when I switched from Shukokai to Okinawa Goji was a lack of twist in the wrist. And she told you there was an idea to hurt with the block and the twisting action was sent. Yeah, I mean, that that is, like I said, with the Tong Long boys, it's a legitimate, a legitimate form of blocking. It's like um, a good solid Kyokushin leg check against someone who doesn't know how to uh, leg kick properly, our leg check is going to blow their leg to bits just because we're so used to being able to deal with that impact. So, um, Mike, I love that idea of using, they, they, they use that twist of the wrist to really hit and damage. And I'm sure in Okinawa and Goju, you do it more than us, so forgive me if I get this wrong, but the whole idea is that we do a block. No block together, one, and then get on, and then chip it, and then two. We used to do this in the day, I remember. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's something we used to do a lot in the dojo to, to harden the arms, and I'm I'm 100% certain that that, is, that originates in Okinawa. Um, uh, and so that idea, too, when you do that, of course, like... Uh, like Dan Gable says, conditioning is the weapon of choice. Dan Gable said it. They all said it. Yeah. Carl Gotch said it. But conditioning is a weapon of choice. And if your body – and I can remember when Gary was getting ready for the semifinal in the world tournament, the three-day world tournament, man, that's a tough gig for anyone. And your body uh, 
your ability to keep fighting is largely determined by your conditioning. And if you can't take a good hit, if you can't take a good whack, well, then you're in, in um, a lot of pain. And even when you work on the idea of the block being just a soft receiving motion, I remember I was talking to Matsui after his 100-man kumite. Uh, Matsui did his 100-man in, I think, 86, 87, before the Fourth World Tournament. And then I interviewed him soon after, and he was saying that soon after his 100-man kumite, he jumped on a plane and flew to New York, and his arms were so badly beat up and bruised that he couldn't, he couldn't put his arms on the armrest. So he'd, he'd have his arms kind of like this, and then he'd get tired, fall asleep, and then his arms would hit the armrest, and he'd go, oh, it was like an <laughs> electrical bolt going through. So even with his style of soft blocking, you're going to have impact. So the, the notion that blocks are not hard blocks, that's as, as fallacious as the notions are not soft receiving. I'm go do hard and soft, and I'm sure both that exists in both. both. Yes, yeah, it is a block to the groin, Michelle, especially a groin kick, um, especially the groin kick. But generally speaking, groin kicks are quite low and fast, so you're not going to get your hand down quick enough. A groin kick is better off blocked with your leg. Like, that's why they go neko ashidachi there like that. You can't see my legs. Um, they're pretty good looking legs. <laughs> um, but for the, for the Michelle, for the groin kick, honestly, it's more this sort of movement here, blocking. But yeah, 100%, you get that block uh, to the groin as well. There, like that. Yep, good call. I didn't mention that. Thanks for reminding me. She thought it was an idea to hurt with the block and the twisting action. Yeah, uh, that's it. Was said to help. That, that's the other thing too, Mike. Like Massa, I'm a says, look, there's a certain way that you're taught to do something, but if it doesn't work, throw it out. If the way you do it does work, well, then that's the right way. So a lot of these things, I mean, I speaking to you, I know that you know that a lot of these little intricacies and twists and this sort of thing, under pressure against a non-compliant opponent whose objective is to hurt you, they, they're the first thing to go out the window. If you can just, first of all, just survive. And for me, that's why I try to get rid of a lot of these um, small wrist manipulations and so on here uh, when your fist is closed. I just kind of keep that 100% of the time. Keep your fist. Keep it strong uh, and and avoid or overcome the the desire to think that there's something funky in some sort of wrist turn it doesn't exist. A lot of guys do that. Look, when they do the block here, they do this sort of thing. And I personally don't like that. For me, from my experience under pressure as a non-compliant opponent, I want my fist integrated. There's no way that I'm going to start to do this sort of thing. I'm just not experienced enough with it. Maybe if I spend another 50 years or another couple of lifetimes, I might get it. But for me, the block is always, and Saul Sai said the same thing, the block the wrist is solid all the way through. But you do see guys do this sort of um, thing as well in Kyokushin. Yeah, good question. Mike, the lower arm was taut, is low, coming across the groin, groin before you pull it back. Ah, Michelle, now I get it. So you mean like this, Michelle? One here, here. Yes, it's there. That's what that elbow coming together does. You'll see it in Uchiuke, get Ambare. Look. Watch my bottom hand. When I do the correct technique, it comes across the groin. There, it comes across the groin. So that you've got that knock away as well. That's a, so when they when they throw the kick, sometimes boom, there's that sort of knock away as well. Because in the street with jeans on and everything, um, it's a very low percentage possibility that they're going to fake the groin and hit you in the head with a roundhouse kick. Okay, so there, so that's where that sort of. Uh, movement does work, yes. So I think I'm on track with what you're saying, Michelle. The bottom hand comes across the groin here, there. That's why the elbows, if the elbows touch, the elbows come together, all those problems are overcome. If it's, if, if it's a head punch, I don't think about the head punch, I think about the elbows coming together, well, then the, the hand will cover the head. Elbows come together, cover the body. Elbows coming together, you get that movement across the groin. And the same in Gerambara, look. Look, 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 look. As the body turns, the hand comes in front of the groin. Look, it stays where it is in space as the body turns around it. Stays where it is. Elbows come together. 
bodies turn around it. So that, I think, is that what you meant, Michelle? Thanks for pointing that out, Mike. I missed that. Right, we'll see. The forearm has two bones in it, depending on the position, two bones by the next to each other. Yeah, I agree. Yes, that's what it looks like in the hickey tea. Yeah, good. Oops, where we go. Um, I'm catching up, guys, with the commentary. Sorry, sorry. Steve Hardy. <laughs> okay. Um, the elbow dictates the height of the fist, the first movement, rather. Okay, this is a little bit too... Um, Takeaway. I found something new last year and simply focusing on the retracting hand, my basics with the elbow connection. Definitely felt new. Yes. Mitch's kicks at 44 years old. Yeah, I know he's a show off. That's why I got him to do the kicks and I did the blocks. Away from you. <laughs> but you know what? Here's a good thing to do. We've done this. We call this chase the belt. It's an idea that I came up with. This is just quickly, I, di I digress. But if you want to work solid head kicks, but your partner can't head kick. Like for Mitch, I, I couldn't get my legs up to his head comfortably anymore. So what you can do is you actually get on the knees. This is really great, and it's really solid training. So first stage is the arm is the kick. One, two, one, two, one, two. And then the second stage is the arm is the kick. One, two, counter. One, two, counter. One, two, counter. Then the third stage is I go to my knees and he actually throws head kicks. Cool. And you can go back. When I work strong defense, this is good if my partner can't reach my head, he can only reach my belt. But by getting on my knees now, I can actually work strong head kick defense. And then I call it chase the belt because it encourages you to keep moving forward. I don't want to do this. Move back because I'll start to fall over. And, and, and I'm going backwards. Okay, so I chase his belt. So as I block, I'm chasing the belt. And I'm coming forward after his belt. Okay, that's a, a, a four-stage um, drill that we developed at the dojo uh, to help um, uh, with defending kicks. Okay. The groin is often blocked, defended with the lead leg. Yes, there you go. Good, as in um, Nekawashi Dutch. Sorry, typing skills are eighth cue. <laughs> yes, Tong Long, kill the weapon. That's what they do. Their concept is whether you throw at me. The downside to that is, too, I think sometimes they infatuate, with all due respect, they infatuate over their ability to damage weapons. So that would make sense against a non-trained person. But if their objective is to kill the weapon against someone who is highly trained, and I remember um, Gary said all he, he, one of his big goals in life was to spar with Filio, Francisco Filio. And then when he finally started with, sparred with Filio, and I've sparred with Filio too, and every square inch of that man's body is rock hard. So the notion of being able to um, kill any weapon that Francisco Filio throws at you is completely um, redundant dreaming yeah <laughs> yeah and even to the point I remember many years ago without mentioning any names I was I was training with some Tong Long guys and they asked me how you throw a, how do you block a leg kick so Mitch, if Mitch throws a leg kick let's go just move this down a bit so we worked on the idea of the leg check we're coming in and getting in I said how do you do it so then they did this and the idea was that that's how they were going. They, they said, we kill the weapon. We use our arms to kill the weapon. And he did it once, and I said, yep, good luck. Um, I'm not having anything to do with this. <laughs> I didn't want to be responsible for death. Lots of that as a young man. Yep, that's right. Happy days. When I was learning boxing heavily, I noticed how similar Gerambara is. Yes, there, that's it. The Philly shell, this 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 peekaboo style, is is that a similar sort of thing? Um, forgive my ignorance, Craig, but yeah, the gate and butter, boom, they're like that all the time. Um, it, if if the Philly shell is not the peekaboo, let me know. But the peekaboo is the same there. You get this Uchiuke get butter movement, very much so. Yeah, the, the elbows together not only makes sense; it's vital 
to the technique. Yeah, good to see you, Alec. Apparently lost favour because the lead arm becomes an elbow strike. Well, yeah, perhaps. In boxing, they wouldn't like that, but good for the street. I can buy the information you have provided today. Yes, work. Mitch, Craig, good. Aust Austino, chase the belt. Yeah, that's um, the latest drill. So there you have it, guys. Um, Mitch, appreciate you joining me, coming oh, thank along. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity. I get to get a Kihon lesson every time I'm here. Uh, so it's my, yeah. I'm, I'm the lucky one. We, we get together. Lately, we haven't been getting together. It's been, no. this year's been a bit uh, busy. Um, but that's our approach to uh, the, the Kihon. The most important key is the wrist height, not fist height, because... If the shoulder, if the fist is in line with the shoulder, the hand's open, they're too low. You get knocked out with a kick every time. By having the wrist at shoulder height, the fingertips come up above the, the eyes and so it allows you to work that um, under what we call under the bridge idea. Um, so I hope that's interesting and helpful for everybody. Um, the Dojo of Mentors and the Budo Blueprint app uh, I just did week seven with the instructional, uh, with the teaching ideas, and th that question arose from a couple of people. Um, so uh, I hope that answers that. And it's an awesome week seven, just fantastic. It is? Yeah, it oh, is. Good. It's great. Yeah, um, we, yeah it's, the app's just genuinely incredible. So many aspects, like holistic nature of it, um, ranges and techniques and history and Japanese and everything. It's um. Week eight is about uh, tournament fighting and prep, which I recognize. Just like week seven, you could do an entire nine-week program on just the content of week seven. I recognize that. The, the whole idea of the nine weeks is to uh, encourage people to think more broadly. Um, week eight is all about tournament fighting, but week nine is actually really interesting. That's where we do go inside and we start to address things like um, karate as a lifestyle, meditation, uh, the breathing, um, how to transfer the values of a solid dojo uh, culture into life. So there you have it. Us. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Jed, great to see you. And like I said, I've got something for you, so I'll have to get in touch and get a postal address off you. Good on you, Mike. I really appreciate whenever you come along. Your insight is always educational for me, hands down. Us, Frederick, good to see you, man. Thanks, guys. Us, thank yep, you. Us. I get so much out of the chats, everyone, too. Yeah. I really get so much. Because you guys, most of you are so much. I mean, nearly everyone's more qualified than me to be here. So I really appreciate the chats, too. I, I listen to them and think about them. And, yeah, I just want to say thank you all. I really appreciate it. Us. Good on you. Thanks. And Rob Wall is Rob Wall. He's oh, been us. training. Rob's 80, I think. Been training ever since. Together. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. And Rob's uh, Rob was training when I was a youngster. Us, thanks, guys. Look forward to it. Us, I'll do that. Us, us, thank you very much. Thanks, Appreciate Mitch. it. Us. Good to see everybody. Cheers. Us.